Sorry about the technical aspect of it. The amazing hardness of hearts is, of people just never cease to amaze me. <coughs> just never cease to amaze me. No matter what circumstance they find themselves in, they, they just won't turn. And so they must die. Okay, if they won't turn, then they will die. God has done everything he's going to do and can do to reach out to man. People complain about God's not doing this and why God filled in the blank. God has done everything he's going to do to, to secure man's redemption. And man will not turn, therefore he must die. He chooses death over life then he will get what he wants. God desires that all men repent. Man desires not to repent, but to choose death. That's what wisdom says in the book of Proverbs. You know, he that hated me loved death. Okay, don't blame God if you die. Is your sin worth this? That's the question. Is it worth it all? Is it, is it worth it? Isaiah 5, verse 15, And the mean man shall be brought down, the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. God is exalted when he judges. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. His judgment, the judgment upon God, will prove the sanctification of God, that God is a righteous God, a righteous judge. The idea that God doesn't judge is stupid. As I've said many times before, you want justice for things you perceive are wrong. But you won't allow God to exercise that same judgment over his planet. Really? And I mean, you make a lot of fuss. That's just wrong. I can't believe that people are getting by with this. But you don't want God to be that over you and the planet that he owns, that he made? Really? Incredible. Isaiah 13. We want to have righteousness. We want to have, a, I should say, a perceived righteousness in looking at a circumstance, situation, and making a judgment, ironically, based upon righteousness. Based upon a form of righteousness. But we don't want God, who is righteous, to make a judgment upon a creation that rejects him by choosing their sin. God says, I don't care what you think. If you choose sin, ye shall die. Verse 9, Isaiah 13. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. God says, fine, keep being proud, keep being arrogant, keep being evil, keep being wicked, keep living in iniquity and you shall die. Your choice. I give you life. I give you my son. I don't need to give you anything else. Everything I've offered, everything I've given is far sufficient to secure your redemption. You want death, so be it. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's not going to be anyone down there complaining about what God is or is doing. They're going to all get down on their knees, on their face, and acknowledge he's right. Isaiah 24, verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgressions thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Wow. God's going to shake it all up. Huge quake. 
that will never be restored again to the way that it was. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. That's what's coming. People keep thinking under this delusion, even professing believers, even, even Americans, all idiots keep thinking it's going to get better if they put this man in office. It's going to get better if they put this party in office. It's going to get better. That's a delusion. That's a delusion. You put whoever you want there. You put too much confidence in man. But who do you hope wins? It doesn't matter what I hope. It's not up to me. It's not my planet. This is God's doing. Well, it sounds like to me you're fatalistic. I don't care what you think, but I'm not fatalistic. I'm just saying that if you keep ignoring God and acting like he doesn't exist, that makes you worse than stupid because it's his world. And you keep thinking that you're in charge of it because what you do really matters in the whole big scheme of things, and it doesn't. The only thing you and I can do that matters is live righteous and proclaim his gospel. That's all. That's all that's required. When it comes time to vote, vote your conscience. Vote for who you know is right. Vote for who you know is upright. And thankfully we have a couple. <laughs> and I already have my mind who, but it's none of your business. I'm not going to sway you one way or the other. And the media is making a big thing out of Donald Trump. And hey, listen, this is every day this stuff is fluid. If you learn one thing about humanity, humanity is fluid as a river and ocean. They just keep changing it. The wave goes in and out, high tide, low tide, tsunamis, nothing. It's just all fluid. Everything just keeps changing. You know, today is Trump, tomorrow will be somebody else. That's how things work. You know, you're all being manipulated. There's always an attempt to manipulate everybody's mind and everybody's... And, and people fall for it. You fall for it all the time. We live on these devices, we, like reality doesn't even matter. Really? So let me see if I got this right. These are neat little things. But you know, when it begins to take over reality, that's idolatry. And we just go on our business. Our lives are now... You know, it's all succumbed to this. Whatever we get, and that, that, you know, that, whatever that says, it must be right. Really? My goodness. That's a tragic thing. And we have all these imaginary friends of ours. People we never met. And we build a big case of imaginary friends. I'll tell you how to know where, where the ones are. Keep putting that truth out there. You'll know. You'll find out your thousand friends just suddenly went down to six. <laughs> the ones who believe in God are only friends hopefully you got everybody else is just there along for the ride God's going to shake this whole thing up and people are giving themselves over to that which God's going to destroy does that make sense to you? get all caught up in the things that are going to pass away amazing and if that wasn't enough look at verse 21 of uh, Revelation 16 <laughs> If that wasn't bad enough, look at this. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, depending upon the scale you use to determine the weight of each individual piece of hail, this is significant. You know, you ever been through hail? We all have with some degree. And some been through little, like, BB-sized pieces of hail. They hurt. I've seen some pictures of probably marble-sized hail. They do pretty good damage to your car. You know, I've even seen a couple clips where you had, like, golf ball-sized hail. And you see the windows begin to shatter on cars and in patios. It's like bullets hitting now those pieces of hail don't weigh much, but the fact they rain down increases the speed and increases the, the trajectory and the, the impact of these hails. But they don't weigh much. I see people pick them up, they put in their hands, and they put, a, they put their cameras in, hey, look at this here, I got me a couple of 
you know, golf ball or marble sized pieces of hail. And you see the damage. You know, I saw one where this guy filled it. It was tearing up his backyard patio furniture. Furniture was getting splintered. The glass shattered. And then he thought about being near the window before it blew up. Then he went out and grabbed pieces of the hail to see how big it was. When you think about this, though, this is a whole different scenario because the Bible says every stone, the weight of a talent, depending upon the scale, the talent can range from 50 to 120 pounds. Let's just say it average 100 pound piece of hail, a individual piece of hail weighing 100 pounds. I mean, when was the last time you picked up 100 pounds? When was the last time uh, something 100 pounds hit you? I think one would be enough. Boop, goodbye. I mean, what the earthquake didn't take out, now you have this plague of hail. It doesn't say how long the plague is. It gives no description whether it's ongoing or temporal or whatever. We can't make any assumption. But whatever it was, you got raining down from heaven. In the midst of all the water being turned to blood, unimaginable, unprotected heat from the sky. The beast kingdom is in total thick blackness causing insanity and people are biting off their tongues because of the pain. There's a pain that's associated with the blackness. Then you have voices thundering from heaven. You have this huge, the, the earthquake of all earthquakes. And if that's not enough, here comes these big giant boulders weighing 100 pounds more or less, raining down upon whatever's left on earth. A hundred. I don't know how many pieces of hail fall during a hailstorm. Do you? Never thought about that. I don't know. There's a lot of hail. I mean, if you were to stand outside and, and go through a hailstorm, it just visually, you could probably estimate maybe, what, 100,000 pieces of hail? That's, that would be a low estimate. If it covers your whole ground, that's a lot of hail. That's not a thousand. That may be hundreds of thousands. And yet, if you all of a sudden, you look up at the sky and you go, what the boom? You have hundreds of thousands of hundred pound boulders of hail hitting the earth. All this simultaneously with the earthquake. Wow. Regardless of the fact that these massive pieces of hail were being rained down from heaven and the amount of them was great, I cannot even imagine the horror of that day. Can't do it. Not only was a hailstorm plague described as great, okay, but exceeding great. Wow. Exceeding great. Greater than great. Amazingly great. Remarkably great. And yet the people that were affected by it, what, were the, what was their response? And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Go back to Exodus 9, please, at verse 18. It was exceeding great. Wow. And someone wants to tell you that Revelation was already fulfilled? Just laugh at them, okay? As you ask them, the, what do these passages mean? What does the plague, what does the, the stone represent? What does the hail represent? It represents hail. <laughs> and what's to come? Look at the contrast between Pharaoh and the people that will experience these huge boulders, 100 pound. I mean, you ever had a kettle ball? How many of you ever picked up a kettle ball. Let's say a 20. That was heavy, wasn't it? Multiply that by five. They don't make 100-pound kettle balls. I picked up a 100-pound dumbbell for a second. Realized I can't pick that up. I lift it off went mm, the inside and, you know, you want to look at the house like it don't bother you. But you picked up like you want to give the appearance you could pick this up. Next time you go to the gym, go to the right side of the weights of the dumbbells. Go to the right side, not the left where you have your five and two pounders. Go to the, all the way to the right side 
of those dumbbells and then attempt to lift up a 100-pound dumbbell and you realize you're a dumbbell. Why they call them dumbbells, all right, but they don't do it for that. But just attempt to lift it up with one hand. And I want you to imagine that being a piece of hail hitting you. How many pieces do you think that it would take you to die? One. Probably one. Two at the most. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one would break the other would, you know, you're gone. And, th and that's it. And that's coming down, raining down. Exodus 9.18, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail. That's God. For I wouldn't let Israel go. God said, I got a plan for you. I want to show you my power. It will I will cause the rain a very grievous hail such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. So God said, I'm going to show you a hailstorm that has not happened since Egypt became Egypt. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle and all that is thou that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. So it is that's the purpose of the hailstorm is to kill. He that feared the words of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his <coughs> servants and the, his cattle flee into the houses. So God said, I'm going to show grace to those who believe my word, even among Egypt. And so those in Egypt that would obey the word of God by, you know, putting their cattle away out of harm's way as a response of fearing the word of the Lord, I'm going to protect. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. So those who didn't believe God's word left their poor cattle and the servants of the cattle in the field. Verse 22. And Lord said unto Moses, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and the fire ran, up, uh, ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was not like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Not only do you have this hail, but it, it, it's fire, it's like a, a missile mingled with the hail. And Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. And the, the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree in the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. So all those in Goshen were protected. And all those Egyptians that feared the word of the Lord and did what God said, were spared. Verse 27. Look at Pharaoh's response. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked. Pharaoh's understanding of God is getting deeper and his admission of of sinfulness is quite humiliating considering that the people treated him as God. Okay, but Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's repentance, of course, is no different from his prior displays of grief because of the trouble he's in. Pharaoh's in trouble. Oh yeah, God is God. We're in trouble. And uh, please have God stop. You're right, we're wrong. That was temporal, of course. But he said something very interesting. He said, God is righteous. God is right in evaluating that he and the Egyptians are evil and that he, God, would fulfill what he said of himself being known because of the plagues. But this man's repentance is superficial the best and Moses knows it and tells him that as well. Verse 28, Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Hmm. So that's, as I said in my commentary, he's still on the please pray for me kick. That's what this is about. I'm in trouble. Pray the Lord will get me out of trouble. He has no intention of repenting. It's like, I'm in trouble now and just ask the Lord to get me out of trouble. It's enough.
tell the Lord to stop the thunderings and the hail and the lightning and all that, and I'll let you go. So you look at Pharaoh's response, albeit it's temporal, but Pharaoh's heart is beginning to get soft and old oh, temporal, albeit temporal. And the plagues humbled him to the degree that he acknowledged the wickedness of the nation and that God is God. Now, he hardened his heart again, but he acknowledged things that he would not normally acknowledge unless God proved himself to be God, and he did. As I said, Pharaoh considered himself to be a God, but once he was overwhelmed by what the true God was doing, in conjunction to what he had said through his servant Moses, he couldn't help but to acknowledge the truth and, and acknowledged it. And acknowledged the reason why God did what he did was because they were evil. They were wicked. Wow. See, so look at that attitude towards a limited hailstorm. Well, be it, it was different. And I look at the attitude of the people, a worse storm in Revelation 16 that it will have really no effect upon the people except that they will become more and more and more blasphemous against God who caused the fall in them. Uh, it will have the same effect as the fourth and the fifth vials. All they're going to do is blaspheme God. They know what God said is true. They know he did what he did. They recognize it was the Lord that did all these things, but they're going to blaspheme God anyway. All right, we're done with 16. Didn't think it was ever going to happen, did you? Well, I'm going to stop at this point. And uh, we may come back here tonight. I don't know. I'm being kind of led in a different direction, really pressed in a different direction. I felt as though when I was going through Romans 1, I didn't really conclude a point that I wanted to. And I was really being dealt with that, that... Uh, two and three. I'm not going to teach all of two and three, but there are some points within two and three that I think need to be emphasized because I know Romans when we talked about mankind will not glorify God because of his or sinfulness. And that is true because that's what the Bible teaches. But far worse than chapter one, far worse than the worst of sinners in chapter one is the even greater sinner of the one who is religious. See the irreligious man and woman, they have no excuse. But the one that's even worse than that is one who is religious because they assume a relationship with God exists and they themselves are looking upon the ones in chapter 1 and scolding them and rejecting them, yet they commit the same sins as those in Romans chapter 1. And God says, you're even more accountable than they are because you assume a righteous position and you assume a relationship that, that you have with me, yet you sin like they did. Your damnation is just. So we don't want to let that escape. That there are a lot of people that will say, yeah, right on, Romans 1, blah, blah, blah. What about Romans 2 and 3? What about the religious sinner? Why are they not held into greater accountability, seeing they assume a relationship exists between them and God, and they assume that and the basis of whereby they can judge others for their sins but not themselves? And so we might see that a little bit tonight. So uh, I think that's important. In fact, I know it is, especially in our age, everyone suddenly wants to be a judge or a critic against this group or that group, but they're not willing to look in the mirror and go, you know what, <laughs> what about my own? I think that when you look at a, a church that never looks in the mirror at her own weakness and sinfulness, I think we've got problems. Now, we, we get satiated and satisfied and sassy and fat in a relationship that never grows because we never see ourselves as God sees us. And I think when you do that, you never apply yourself to grace where you can change. Because God's plan is for constant growth. Ours is for constant stagnation. Ours is constant status quo. God says, I want you to be daily conformed. That means you can't keep being like you are all the time. You get to that rut where you don't want to change or grow. And then you get upset when someone kicks your rut down or puts dirt on your rut or in your rut. Like, what are you doing? Well, this rut needs to be filled. You know why? Because it doesn't need to be there. 
God says, this rut is there. Someone's going to fall into it. And if they fall into it, they're going to be hurt. Now, you might be satisfied down in that rut, but I'm not going to keep that rut there. So dirt starts getting poor. Wait, wait, wait. wait. No, you want to be there. You think that rut's comfortable. Okay, well, let's put some dirt over you, and then we'll see what happens. We're not going to leave that rut there so you can bring people down in there with you. I want people growing and changing. It means they have to face the fact in the rut and want to get out of it. And we get that, get that level where we just, you know, we basically have ruddy entity, and we just want to stay in that rut. And then God shows us things about ourselves and we ignore them. Well, I already knew that. Really? I, I don't think that's the right response. Like, wait a minute. Do you really see yourself as God sees you? Well, God sees me in Christ. Do you see yourself? If we don't see who we really are, we can't grow. Of course God sees you in Christ. He couldn't stand and look at you any other way, but see yourself for who you are and grow. When God conforms a people, he shows them who they are so they can take measures to be conformed. Why would he show us ourselves? He says, I want you to recognize that this is you. That means you have to acknowledge, you have to agree with what God says about you, and then the need of change that God can only change you. Okay, so I need to submit to his plan so that God can conform me to the image of Christ, not to the image of me. I need to be looking more like Christ. I mean, he's got to recognize I'm not there. I need to be daily conformed to his image so I can look more like him and not like me. Or as John said, he must decrease, or rather, I must decrease, he must increase. I'm never going to be finished. I'm never going to be the place, okay, I think I'm, I'm not okay. Nobody is. We have to keep growing. Recognize who you are. Who you are. Recognize the need of constant conformity to Christ. And submit joyfully to him and his plan and what he teaches. And man, that's going to be some super growth. All right. Lord, thank you again for who you are. And I, I just continue to pray that we would seek your face and seek your will and seek your plan and be thankful that we are privileged to be used in any respect to glorify your name and who you are. <sighs> Thank you, Lord, for your mercies. Thank you for the truth. In Jesus' name. We had a little technical deal, as we seemingly always do. In fact, we had a technical deal in both the audio and the video, so. But, uh, I don't know, we'll see. Anyway, Lord willing, tonight, thanks for tuning in today. Lord willing, we'll see you tonight. More of the word. You never have to concern yourself about this program, whether you're going to get the word or not. A lot of people, they <coughs> approach their churches and programs. I don't know if we're going to get the Bible. I've been there. I know what you're saying. You know, you go to a church and the first thought of your mind is, well, is he going to teach the word tonight or not? I had to get out of that. <laughs> I can't survive in that kind of an environment and that's just religious nonsense. Find a Bible teaching church and submit to the word of God and you'll be blessed. Lord willing, see you tonight, 4 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And thank you. Share the word. Let people know we're here. They too can hear the word. See you later. <laughs>